Unions build. Roads, bridges, and buildings. Yes. But with training and apprenticeship programs, unions build much more. A safer community, careers without crushing debt, and a route to rebuild the American middle class. Unions build the future. And we're just getting started. Join us. Today on Built to Last, taking a reality check. You're building something much the way that, you know, your kids might be playing on Minecraft. She's got skills. If they're trained properly, you can go anywhere. And there's no place like home. Bring opportunity, bring change, bring some life. Pick up a hammer, it's time for Built to Last. Built to Last is brought to you by the Chicago Regional Council of Carpenters Labor and Management Committee and Armstrong Ceilings. Faster, easier, better. Welcome to Built to Last. I'm Monica Peterson. And I'm Mark Nilsson. We're here at the Chicago Regional Council of Carpenters Apprenticeship and Training Center, where the apprentice carpenters learn to build a wide array of structures. Perhaps nothing they build, though, means as much to people as homes. Whether it's through using state-of-the-art technology or by creating a more diverse workforce, skilled labor is constantly striving to make its ranks more robust. But they don't only look inwards. Tradesmen and women are also active in giving back to their communities as well. More on that later. Our first story shines light on phase one of the revitalization of an historic piece of Chicago real estate. When complete, it will provide housing to people from a range of income levels as it becomes a vibrant and attractive community within the city. The Julia C. Lathrop home sit on 35 and a half acres of prime riverfront property. Constructed by the Public Works Administration in 1937, they mark Chicago's first venture into public housing. It was coming out of a time uh, through the Public Works Administration when the country was really making a strong effort to create good quality, affordable housing. Back then it was more transitional housing. You're in there, you do what you need to do, you moved out, there was no social, you know, uh, education, libraries, or anything like that. I'm a long time Lathrop resident. I've been living here 36 years in the same unit. As the Chicago Housing Authority developed more properties over the next decades, their location and composition reflected government policies that encouraged segregation. Let's be for real, you know, black and brown people were not, they didn't want to be in the North, and people in the North didn't want them to be in there. When urban renewal raised so-called blighted neighborhoods in the 50s, it created the need for permanent housing for the people it displaced and ushered in the age of high-rise public housing. Back then, we accepted anything because we were so giddy because we got housing, subsidized housing. A lot of us mothers used to meet together here and lay up at the playground with our children, and we would get to talking. We were uh, faced with a lot of um, disparity, walls falling apart, apartments flooding. We were supposed to have these services, and we were not receiving them. Lathrop was totally public housing, okay? And so you had social services that you couldn't meet because of the demand and the, and the funding that we did not have, and so everyone was, was struggling. In 1968, the federal government stopped funding high-rise buildings for family housing. CHA's focus turned to low-rise, scattered site housing. CHA and my colleagues across the country, we don't build monstrosities anymore. We, we found that we could not manage a family development in, in those types of, of settings. Desegregating neighborhoods, but making neighborhoods better so they'd have opportunities and feel like everyone else in their community. At Lathrop, we were able to connect the surrounding communities. We wanted to connect and at the same time bring opportunity, bring change, bring some life. Everything was quite different back then. How you come through the door, how do you come into your unit? The furniture, the, the way the, the, the floor plan was and so forth. The bedrooms didn't have, uh, aesthetically, they, they just didn't look in inviting. They had the same outdated stoves. They're gonna put two pots on there. At one time, the, the oven was real small and so forth. This makes it make more sense. A refrigerator, you have a, a washer and dryer in, in the position where it should be at. 
Over 400 units are gonna be built here, part CHA, part affordable, and part market rate. Working on the financing and getting this in construction and rehab for the last nine years. And so now we, we're in the first phase here. As the carpenters are seeing people move in, I hope they listen and I hope they hear um, just how happy people are. I think they're gonna be overjoyed because we've had another project similar to this one and it's been the same results. They love it when they come in and they see the new, the new renovated projects. I saw carpentry in the ad and I kind of thought that I would be doing cabinets. And I liked it. I liked the tools, I liked the freedom, and I liked the challenge. People from the south side, the west side, and the central part of town all want to be able to participate in, in what we build and what we do. And the partnership that we've enjoyed with the Carpenters Union, who share our desire to provide opportunities that otherwise might not be provided. Half the reason that I thought this was so neat was all of the green space that they're planning on building in this kind of courtyard environment where hopefully it will create opportunities for shared space. The landscaping here uh, it was actually designed by Jen Jensen in uh, 1938 and we're, we're complying to a lot of historical requirements to bring it back to the true original state it was in. There's about a quarter mile of river walk work uh, going on and a uh, new bridge, a new pedestrian bridge that actually jets out over the Chicago River underneath the Diversity Bridge and comes back onto the south side of the property. Between the Great Lawn, the river, the river walk, the dog parks that are going on in here, it's gonna be truly something special. I still can't believe this is my home that's being changed like this. It feels like the right way to go about starting neighborhoods or trying to reinvigorate neighborhoods. Related CHA, the staff, the city, and also the state, that we put this together and we put our best foot forward to make this, this development look, look as good as it does now. You knock all these things down, you take the heart out of a neighborhood. We want to rehab it, it's historical. That's what I love about Lakeland Homes. It's the diversity, it's the kindness of the heart of the people. When you have that, you got everything going out and doing inspections or quality reports, we can actually overlay the model in a headset so as you walk around on the job site, you can see what's been installed. At Armstrong Ceiling and Wall Solutions, we take great pride in making a positive difference in the lives of people. With the broadest portfolio in the industry and the technical performance to back it up, you can design and install with confidence. Our ceiling construction expertise, training, and pre-engineered ceiling solutions make it easy for you to seamlessly transition from one end of the building to the other. Improve construction efficiencies and keep every job on time, on budget, and on the mark with Armstrong Ceiling and Wall Solutions. Faster, easier, better. When you need a concrete contractor for your commercial project, you can't waste time waiting through countless unproven contractors who don't specialize in the job type you need or service your area. ConcreteIL.com lets you browse Northern Illinois' top contractors to find the perfect fit for your exact needs. You can filter our vetted list of contractors by both job type and location, and even request proposals directly through the site. Thinking commercial concrete? Think ConcreteIL.com. From bridges and trains to iconic high-rises, have you ever wondered who's powering Chicago? Power Unlike our sports heroes, they go unnoticed. Yet they proudly keep our businesses, homes, and great city running. IBEW Local 134 electricians and the electrical contractors have the experience, training, and reliability to keep Chicago open for business. When you think about the tools of the trades, you likely imagine things like hammers and wrenches. While those will always be in the skilled hands of tradesmen and women, today they're adding items like iPads and VR goggles to their tool belts. Check this out. This is 1200 South Indiana, now named Nema Chicago. It's an 81 story high rise that Gertz Electric was the design build contractor on. So in that instance, we're not only building the uh, building, we're also doing the engineering and design for the projects. Early in the project, you've got, you've, you'll have a structural model and an architectural model. That's the bare bones project, it's the bare bones building. Right now we're in the main switch gear room for the job. This is where all the power for the project uh, feeds the rest of the building. Everything from, from one to 82 gets, is sourced from this room. 
you have the structural model, which comes from the structural engineer, and you have the architect's model, and that was it. And then from that point, added in 3D modeled uh, all the electrical systems up into the building. Revit is where we do the design, and then Navisworks is where we come together and look at it in a 3D space. Rather than looking at the 2D prints, you can actually see whether or not the ductwork that you're planning on running in a specific place is going to hit somebody else or if you have a wide open path. BIM itself stands for Building Information Modeling, technical, professional term. You're building something much the way that, you know, your kids might be playing on Minecraft, but it's got all this additional information of other people that are building along with you. Although BIM, Building Information Modeling, and Virtual Construction Technology is relatively new. It has been around for a few years and we've captured a lot of data. We can now predict things in the future and do multiple iterations of design with a machine. Not only designing and constructing through the model, but actually operating and maintaining our facilities through that same model. So then I think the next step is going to be training your building engineers, your you know, final end users of how to utilize this information. They could look above the ceiling without having to go above the ceiling by utilizing it in the model. So I head up our integrated construction services department and that is comprised of three different departments. Pre-construction is one of them, so all of our estimating goes through there. Um, high performance is another department within there and virtual design and construction is the third department. The next step of that is virtual reality is kind of how it started, but now we've got these augmented reality devices. So the Microsoft HoloLens, what we're going to see is the ability to create 3D models in a program called Revit, load those into the augmented reality HoloLens device, and you'll see what you're supposed to build in front of you by, by putting on these lenses. Some examples of that is, we look at underground utilities on a project. When we're digging in the ground, this could produce an unsafe condition if you do not know what's underground. But now our workers can put headsets on and they can see what's under the ground before they dig. And then we've had a safe environment. And this requires no training. Additionally, when we're going out and doing inspections or quality reports, we can actually overlay the model in a headset. So as you walk around on the job site, you can see what's been installed and also see the models overlaid. So you can catch quality defects early or plan for the future as well without the use of drawings. This project was already actually out of the ground going up, pouring concrete, and they were still making changes. So if you're able to go into the model, and, and look at a route or look at what your, what your limitations will be. We could have a project manager that makes a change in the office and then pushing that information out to the iPads in the field. Up to our guys doing the install the same day. I do all the, all the units, so if we have any changes that occur in the units, if there's outlets or switches that have to be relocated, any lighting that has to be relocated, that stuff gets all updated on my iPad. Just I just click on it and it gives me all the information on what got updated, what my new dimensions are. It's pretty cool. The best part is just being able to be more productive in your workplace. I also teach at the IBW NECA Technical Institute. So I teach to apprentices and journeymen. We're training in Bluebeam, Navisworks, Revit, Dropbox, the file sharing systems so that we can utilize the information that's getting pushed to us. You know, we have a dedicated team of CAD operators, BIM coordinators, and a field electricians who are all trained in this technology and thereby make sure that the install gets done right the first time. You never really think that if, as an electrician, your career would be impacted by the tech boom that we've seen in the last 10 or 12 years. And, you know, here I am. So it is, it is a pretty cool feeling. So not only is it a savings to the owner and Gertz Electric to make sure our stuff is represented correctly and gets installed, but all of the trades work together to make sure all of the building systems work together and then get installed right the first time. Early LiDAR, light detection and ranging technology employed in BIM was used by Apollo 15 astronauts to map the surface of the moon. The other wonderful thing about the trades is they're gonna pay for your school. So it's the kind of thing you're able to do while you have financial responsibilities. Keeping restaurants and hotels up to date with the latest design trends is a constant challenge. 
Finding qualified contractors isn't at finishingchicago.com. We work with top designers and general contractors who use the latest painting, drywall finishing, and wall covering techniques in Chicagoland's premier hotels and restaurants. The hospitality industry relies on finishingchicago.com as its free resource to find quality finishing contractors. For a great finish, start with finishingchicago.com. 24-7, IBEW Local 9 linemen are there protecting you and your family from the moment you wake up with the power in your home, on your way to work, lighting the way and easing congestion, plus keeping you safe with traffic lights and cameras so the next time you're at a stoplight, pass under a power line, or just pull into your brightly lit neighborhood. Think of your friends at IBEW Local 9. We'll continue to light the way for you. Meet us online at IBEW9.org. Roadblocks are common on just about everyone's career path, but that isn't stopping a group of women who, with the determination of Rosie the Riveter, are knocking down these blockades and opening the road to success for women interested in a career in the trades. I wanted to work for a women's empowerment organization, and at that time, I was an avid hobby carpenter. And when I heard about Chicago Women in Trades, I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> that's perfect. So I've been here for 18 years, and um, I can't leave or die until we make a little more progress. <laughs> I started my career in 1980 as an elevator constructor, but I also began it um, with an employer who said to me, you don't really want to do this job. This isn't a great job for a girl to do. It's too dangerous. It's too dirty. You're not going to like it. I kept saying, yes, I do. Yes, I can. Yes, I will. <laughs> but I managed to um, connect with a group of women carpenters. We thought we really need to create an, a tradeswomen's organization, and that's how Chicago Women in Trades was formed. That eventually uh, led to the development of the Technical Opportunities Program, which is our pre-apprenticeship program, which started in 1987. We do hands-on experience in carpentry, electrical, plumbing and pipe fitting, sheet metal, painting and drywall finishing. And they usually do it through a field trip to that apprenticeship school. So they get to meet those people, build their confidence a little bit, and they get to experience the different trades and they can really see, oh, I like this. A lot of women uh, like a job where you can see the result of your effort. If you wire up a house, turn on the switch and the lights come on, ah, you did a good job. The heart of Chicago Women in Trades has been a dual focus to build women's capacity to be competitive candidates, but at the same time to keep the pressure on contractors, apprenticeship programs, and unions to open the doors. We are very happy to have the support both of the District Council 14, uh, the union, and the finishing trades. And District Council 14 has a great women's committee. The Women's Committee on Organizing DC 14 Painters was formed under the help of Chicago Women in Trades. To get into the program, you need to have a letter of intent to hire from a contractor. Contractors need to hire more women and people of color. You have the best candidates out there. If somebody wants to be a union painter, okay, let's bring them in. Finishing Chicago especially thought that by bringing the contractors here to see the program, we could open their eyes about the opportunities that were available to hire qualified women out of this program. I mean, it's a proven fact that the more diversified your workforce is, the more diversified your team is, the more productive it is. And we did uh, diversity workforce training for our contractors earlier this year, showing them the importance of diversifying their workforce. And so this is now a practical step that we want to put in to accomplish our goals of becoming more diversified in the finishing industries. And I can speak for the contractors. I plan to be a joining woman in the next four years. I take the carpenter's entrance exam tomorrow, which I feel more than prepared for because of the schooling here at Seawit. I uh, came out today because I'm looking to become a finisher. I want to get into drywall. Um, super valuable just to meet with the different contractors to get some advice on what would put me kind of ahead of the competition. They do great things as far as preparing females in the trade 
and, uh, but nobody really knows about it. So this is a chance for our contractors to come on board to learn what they do as far as training to get women prepared for the job sites. A lot of people come to us because they need more opportunity to support their families. You know, work to fix things, to build things, to maintain things. And so, you know, there's quite a sense of pride that comes with it. The other wonderful thing about the trades is they're going to pay for your school. So it's the kind of thing you're able to do while you have financial responsibilities. I also would like the women to be active in the local because what are we fighting for? Fighting for women to get in the trade, but we're fighting for our union job. So this is a unique time with the city. It's a, a time that is really full of promise, and so as progress is possible, it's now. I had a few ideas in my head. I sketched it out on, a, you know, basically an eight by 10 blueprint. To approach the city of Carpentersville, told them what our intentions were with the Owens family. When you have plumbing issues in your home, it can disrupt your whole routine. At Plumbers 911, we connect you with a highly experienced plumber in five minutes or less. We call it our five minute promise. All of our expert plumbers are highly trained, background checked, licensed, and insured, so you can feel confident that your job will be done right the first time. Our phones are open 24-7 to help solve your problem, day or night, at 1-833-PLUM-911. Plumbers 911, your plumbing connection. We are DeWalt. We're the ones who grind it out. The ones using materials from all over the world to build the things that build America right here in America. And there's no place we'd rather be. Land of the free, tools of the brave. This is a team. It's made up of different players, positions, skills. Talented, sure, but on their own. Because every team needs a coach, someone who makes things work together. That's how less it works. We're coaches in the construction industry, bringing together laborers and management, unions and contractor associations. Our work leads to safer, stronger construction, which is a win for us all. Skilled tradesmen and tradeswomen have a long tradition of playing active roles within their community, whether it's for a brother or sister of the union or just a neighbor in need. We met in college um, our first year as freshmen. Everybody's like, oh, you guys would make a good couple. And I'm like, no way, he has a jerry curl. So our junior year, I was president of the Black Student Union and he was vice president. And you know, I said, oh, wow, he's kind of smart. So they married and settled in a Chicago suburb called, of all things, Carpentersville. And Melanie became a teacher and... I'm a senior financial analyst for Quest Diagnostics. We've been together for 27 years now. With two sons for Henry to devote his time to. I coach uh, middleweight uh, football for the Lake in the Hills Junior Eagles. Coaching is his passion. I mean, football, basketball, whatever, just being around the kids and helping them grow and develop. And it was partially Henry's passion for football that led them to take a road trip, stopping at the Football Hall of Fame and ending at Myrtle Beach. We were um, transferring from the parasailing boat to the banana boat. Um, he got on first, I got on second, and my oldest son Amari got on third. And then they told Henry to move up. When they told him to move up, he slipped and fell overboard. And 15 seconds passed, he started to panic a little bit, 20 seconds, panic even more. And finally, they moved the boat. And then as they turned the banana boat around, he popped up on the side. There was clearly something wrong, but Melanie did not know what. As we pulled him over the side of the boat, uh, one of his legs completely fell off. It was severed. Henry was bleeding profusely as they raced to the shore. By the time we made it to the hospital, they said that he had lost so much blood, they had to revive him, so he actually died. Um, and then they put him in a medically induced coma and, um, and uh, amputated the other leg. Kevin Sippel is the volunteer organizing chairman from Local 363. I was uh, at home one day and I read an article in the newspaper about a tragic accident. 
I was trying to not think about it, and I thought about it some more, and I wound up calling Lutheran General Hospital. Kevin Sippel reached out to Lutheran General Hospital, one of the administrators there, and said, hey, we're a local carpenters group, and we want to help. Which meant uh, wheelchair ramps and widening doorways and uh, accessibility to bathrooms. So uh, he presented to me this challenge, and uh, I said, run with it. Kevin contacted me while I was uh, basically on vacation and uh, said that uh, we have a project coming up. Uh, the Owens family had a tragic accident, and uh, we needed to assist them. And on July 4th, and we made arrangements to meet at the house. I think some of the neighbors have started the project, but it wasn't the code. I had a few ideas in my head. I sketched it out on, a, you know, basically an 8x10 blueprint. We approached the city of Carpentersville, told them what our intentions were with the Owens family. You know, when I heard the union came in and we kind of took over the project, that it was going to be done professionally. They got on board. They issued us uh, permits. And we were starting to go over all the trades that we would need, uh, all the trades from the Fox Valley Building Trades, uh, regional council, everybody, so we made uh, basically a hit list. The, the, the plumbers uh, union, the, the painters union, the laborers union, electricians, uh, and the sheet metal workers. In addition to the trade unions, suppliers jumped in and donated the necessary materials to support the construction efforts. We had basically repaired the, uh, the landing area, the downward ramp after the switchback. We uh, took out the concrete that was there and replaced that concrete slab with something pitched. Like Kevin was just phenomenal. All the guys were too, but he is so attentive to detail. And you know, it was such a tough time for my boys. He would like bring them, get them involved in the job, you know, put on the glasses, help, let them help frame, let them help like, you know, nail some things. Inside the house, we want to pitch in the floor so he can get the wheelchair over the threshold. PFIA was contacted by the carpenters to furnish and install new flooring that would be suitable for use here. I have to give it to my wife for letting me have the opportunity to, to destroy her office to make it into a bedroom for me. And we attached the bathroom to that bedroom that was an existing powder room and a closet. He can roll into the shower now and, you know, not have a problem. Normally would have been a three, maybe even a four day process, but uh, speed was of the essence and to get Mr. Owens home. I mean, the accident happened less than but now six weeks ago. All this is just surreal because now I can actually stay on the first floor and be comfortable and be independent. Thank you is never going to be enough. We know the boys, we know Melanie, we know Hank. It felt great going through the project. It felt great working with the family. And you could see, even during construction, that it was going to be something that he could use. You now, everybody who did what they did, they did it because they felt it was the right thing to do. They needed us, and, and we needed them. It is part of being a, a union member. That's all for this episode of Built to Last. Be sure to check us out on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Hey, Monica, did you hear the one about the roof? Yeah, but I was sure that one would be over your head. Boom. Ouch. <laughs> really?